So hello everyone again uh, in this last uh, first in this last uh, talk of the first series uh, of talks in this new God seminar. We are again the speaker is Kostas Karagans from the Manchester, and we would like to thank thank him again for for this uh, talk. So Costa, you can start. Thank you, Agile. Okay. Um... So I will start uh, again before I start, actually, as I did last time. Um, I will. Um, um, I was just asked to give some uh, some reference textbooks for some of the concepts we discussed last time uh, on local cohomology, um, uh, resolutions, uh, regularity, the Czech complex, and so on. The most appropriate textbook is the first one. Um, the second one is uh, maybe the most classic uh, textbook in um, for a second course, for an advanced course in cognitive algebra. And the connection between the algebraic and the geometric uh, viewpoint on regularity and local cohomology is very well described in Eisenberg's second textbook, um, like a continuation of his classical cognitive algebra. Uh, okay, so uh, let me start again by... Um, recapping uh, very briefly what we discussed in the previous two lectures. Um, so in the first lecture, I introduced the problem from classical invariant theory. Uh, so when you have a finite group acting on a polynomial ring, uh, Emily Nether proved that uh, the ring of invariants uh, is a finitely generated algebra over the ground field for any field. Okay? She also proved that over the complex numbers, the degrees of the generators uh, are bounded by the order of the group. And um, this was generalized many years later by James Fogarty and Peter Schleiman, uh, Fleischmann, sorry, uh, who proved that Noether's bound holds uh, for any field whose characteristic is co-prime to the order of the group. Uh, and the final result in that direction was given by Peter Simons in 2011, uh, who proved that uh, in the context of modular representation theory, uh, the degrees of the generators are bounded by the number of variables times the order of the group minus one. Uh, so our goal for this series of talks is to generalize this result uh, when one replaces the acting object uh, by a finite group scheme. Uh, and we defined it using these four different viewpoints, either uh, as a representable group functor uh, or as a group object in the category of affine schemes, uh, or uh, as an object, um, as a scheme whose coordinate ring is um, a commutative Hopf algebra, or uh, starting with a group algebra with a not necessarily commutative, but necessarily co-commutative Hopf algebra, uh, dualizing uh, to get uh, the commutative Hopf algebra as the coordinate ring, and then proceeding as the previous. Uh, to study representations and actions, uh, one can take advantage of these four viewpoints. The functorial viewpoint, which is equivalent to the geometric viewpoint, uh, which is equivalent to the commutative algebraic viewpoint, which is equivalent to the group algebra, the representation theoretical um, So if one takes an affine scheme X with a G action, uh, one still has three of the four viewpoints, right? We are missing um, the representation theoretic viewpoint because X is not assumed to be a group object. And then we define our actions uh, vertically, if you wish, on this diagram. Uh, so either uh, functorially, the functor of points G acts on the functor of points X, or geometrically, the functor, uh, sorry, the, um, the scheme G acts on the scheme X. Uh, or commutative algebraically, uh, by flipping the arrows, because spec is a contravariant vector. Um, so we get a map from the coordinate ring of X to the tensor product of the coordinate rings of X with the coordinate ring of G. Uh, or more classically, in terms of representation theory, uh, as uh, a module over the finite dimensional algebra. Um, which is just uh, a vector space equipped with a multiplication. 
and then to define invariants, since invariants are subrings of coordinate rings, so they are algebraic objects, uh, so the algebraic definitions make sense. Uh, the easiest way is viewing obviously the representation field. So we can require that the action of the group algebra is trivial. Okay, so we take all the polynomials in the coordinate ring, all the functions that um, remain unchanged under the action of the group algebra. And remember that we said that unchanged in that context is not necessarily x times s equals to s. Okay, uh, you need to multiply s with the co unit evaluated at x. In the case of groups, this is your normal definition. But for Lie algebras, uh, invariance means that x acts on s um, equal to zero. Or uh, you can use uh, the other number three uh, and define the ring of invariance as elements uh, on which the coordinate ring coacts trivial. So you take the elements s that map to the trivial element s tensor. Uh, now, the geometric or the functorial viewpoint was missing. Uh, and this is because in geometry, things work a bit more weirdly. It's a bit obscure. But intuition tells us that invariance of the coordinate ring uh, give us functions on the orbits. Okay. So the ring of invariance is the coordinate ring on the orbit space. Okay, uh, and the orbit space, in principle, uh, in our context, is well defined. It's a very well behaved, nice, fine scheme. But in theory, in more general context, uh, it might be very badly behaved, and this is what leads to geometric invariant theory, the theory of stacks, and so on. Okay, but the punchline is invariants are functional. We saw that by Grothendieck's integrality result combined with the Artin Tate lemma. Uh, invariants of a finitely generated K algebra are also finitely generated, which means that we can write the invariants as a polynomial expression in some, as we call them, fundamental invariants, right? And our goal is to bind the degrees of these fundamental invariants. The formal language which allows us to do this it was introduced by Mumford in the 1960s uh, and is called regularity. Okay. So we introduce regularity in two ways. Uh, this can be done for any graded module M over a polynomial. Okay, in our context, M is the ring of invariance. We saw that it's a graded module over some polynomial. So you can introduce regularity either using the minimal graded free resolution of the function, which keeps track of the generators between the relations of the, sorry, keeps track of the degrees of the generators of the module, keeps track of the degrees of the generators of the relations between the module, and so on. And loosely, we can define regularity as the largest degree over all generators of all relations. Or we can define regularity using the check complex, which is just taking localizations. Okay. This is called H reg. H stands for homogeneous. Uh, and this can be defined as the largest degree in which the cohomology of that complex, okay, kernels modulo images, is not vanishing. And we saw uh, that there is this theorem of Eisenberg and Goto for which they don't want to take credit. Uh, they want to be, they are modest and they attribute it uh, to Mumford uh, that these two concepts of regularity do not exactly coincide, but one determines the other. Okay, so if you can compute one of the two, you know the other. So in our context, the first version gives us the, the, the bound on the degrees of the generators, but we will compute it using the second. So, this is how I ended my previous talk. I gave you a diagram of logical dependencies for the proof. So the goal is to bound the degrees of the generators. By definition, 
this amounts to bounding the free resolution version of regularity, which by the theorem we saw is equivalent to the check complex version of regularity, which by definition is given by the vanishing of the cohomology of the check complex. And the cohomology of a complex vanishes exactly in the degrees in which the complex is exact. Okay. So this is what I'm going to do today. I am going to prove, I'm going to give you arguments why the check complex is exact, okay? So we proceed uh, to the main theorem. Maybe before I do so, uh, I just want to make a general comment. It was observed that I have fewer slides today uh, and I excused myself by saying that I don't have um, the funny comic type uh, slides today, unfortunately, because I don't have time. Uh, I want to do the proof. Uh, and you know, this, this just says that when you tell a story in three parts, um, it's very difficult to live up to the expectations of part one and part two, right, in part three. And I mean, this is not only my problem, I think. Uh, not even Francis Ford Coppola could do it, right? Uh, the third part was uh, received much worse than the first two. Uh, so uh, hopefully this justifies uh, if you find this lecture a bit less entertaining, let's say, than the first two. Uh, by the way, this is, I think, the only joke uh, I'm going to make today. Okay, so uh, let's recall briefly some basic notions from homological algebra. Uh, so let's see be a complex. We can always and we should always be thinking about the check complex. Okay. So a complex is exact uh, if and only if by definition its cohomology is zero, meaning that the images of the maps are not just contained in the curve. This is the definition of the complex, but they are actually equal to the kernel. Okay. A complex is split if and only if you can always find maps going the other direction, okay, than the chain maps uh, that satisfy some basic compatibility uh, criteria. I haven't written the, the relation here, but it's what you expect it to be, right? If you want to compose uh, and get something trivial. Um, Split exact is just conjunction, okay? It is both split and exact. And uh, clearly, we don't expect that the complex will be exact fully or split exact fully because then everything would be trivial, right? We would expect it to be exact, split, or split exact in some degrees and above, okay? Which means that you know, the upper part, you choose your upper end to be somewhere here, and all the part to the left will be exact split or split exact, okay? Um, and the rest, we don't care about, okay? So the notation for that is just C, uh, this should have been a subscript, okay? Which is just a typo, uh, greater than N, just means that the property holds, not for all I, but for I greater than N, okay? Uh, so let's see how split exactness can be used in the context that we wanted. From now on, S will be my finitely generated K algebra. You can think of the polynomial ring all the time, okay, with a G action, <clears throat> which makes the invariance a graded module over some other polynomial ring. Uh, now, by definition, okay, the check complex on the invariance is exact in degrees greater than n, if and only if the regularity is bounded by n. And this is just a restatement of the definitions, okay? Both statements really tell you that this number n is the largest degree in which the cohomology of the complex does not vanish, okay? The first one is the definition of exactness. The second one is the definition of regularity. The problem here is that computing the check complex for invariance kind of beats the purpose because we don't know the invariance. We're trying to understand it. So we don't to reduce the problem to a property, a question for the check complex associated to the original ring. Okay. 
and this is not too hard to do. Okay, this is not too hard to do. It actually turns out that if your original check complex is both split and exact, then the check complex on the invariance is exact, which gives you the bound on regularity. This follows because invariants commute with localization. So if you take the check complex on S, all of it, and you apply the functor of invariance, the complex you will get is the check complex on the invariance. Okay. And then we have the general categorical statement okay, that additive functors do not necessarily preserve exactness. Invariants don't preserve exactness because otherwise we wouldn't be dealing with group homology. But invariants preserve split exactness. Okay, this is a general statement. So if we prove that the check complex is split exact, then we will have exactness for the complex over the invariants, which will give us the bound in the degrees of exactness. So this is what Peter Simons did for finite groups in 2014, okay? So in the context of a finite group, an honest group, not a group scheme, okay? Acting on a polynomial ring, he was able to prove that the check complex is split exact in sufficiently high degrees. This implies that the regularity is bounded, okay? And also, we get a very important corollary of this statement, which I have not motivated yet. Okay. It's a representation theoretic property that tells us that the polynomial ring is what we call in the composably finite as a representation. I will discuss this property towards the end of my talk. Okay. But if you are a representation theorist, uh, you might probably be even more interesting, interested in this third part than the regularity uh, statement. Okay. I could have motivated my series of talks with number three, um, but I just decided that it was uh, easier for me to convince you if I invoked Hilbert and Nether. So I did it with number two. Okay. So, sorry, yes. sorry. Uh, you said regularity is bounded, but you are writing. Uh, Non-positive. Yes, this is the distinction between H reg, okay, H reg and reg. Okay, if H reg ah. is less than the number m, okay, good comment. Yeah. Thank uh, you. This is H reg and reg. Okay. Thanks. Instead, I could have write, uh, could have written H reg less than m. Okay, and this is exactly what you want. Um, so, just a general another comment here is that uh, the regularity statement had been proven already by Peter Simons in 2011 in a very big celebrated paper in the annals. Um, then the composable finiteness result had been proven in 2007 by uh, Dikran Karagusian and Peter Simons in an also very celebrated paper. Um, what Peter did in 2014 is he was able to come up with a stronger statement, a more general proof <clears throat> that comes from the Czech complex which implies the other two, more or less. Okay, number three needs some work. Uh, the advantage of this is that now this new proof is generalized. Okay, we can generalize to group schemes, whereas <clears throat> the original proofs of 2007 and 2011 uh, were not. Okay. So, this is the statement of our main theorem. The analog, when one replaces the acting object, by a group scheme. Okay. There is a technical assumption, which I'm going to waive for the moment, mm -hmm. that the statement is not true for all group schemes. We need some version of unipotency. Okay. And unipotency can be thought of uh, as unipotent matrices. Uh, so matrices which are upper triangular and the diagonal is one. Okay, if this is a matrix group, this is what a unipotent algebraic group is. Uh, so under a unipotency assumption on the group scheme, we have the exact same results. Okay, the check complex splits, the regularity is bounded, 
and in the composer doing finiteness of chords. So what I will do for the rest of maybe the last 30 minutes is prove split exactness and intuitively, right? Intuitively from homological algebra, uh, split exactness is related to the concept of projective modules, right? Um, so we're going to introduce a variant of the notion of projectivity uh, that will imply split exactness. And that variant is what is called relative projectivity. So to, to, to define relative projectivity, uh, maybe we need to recall what absolute, let's say, projectivity is. A very simple classical concept. I will do it for finite groups, but you can do it for any finite dimension. So a module is projective if one definition is the lifting problem. So whenever you have a map from your module to an arbitrary n and a surjection from another module n to n, you can always find a lifting map from p to n that makes a diagram. That's one definition. The second definition is that any surjection from P splits. And this is what we want for split exactly, right? So you can always find a map going the other direction, such that composition is the identity. Okay. This is equivalent to splitting short exact sequences. Or you can ask for the module to be a direct sum of the free module, another equivalent definition. But there's a fourth characterization, which is the one that we want to use, which is motivated more from, let's say, Galois theory. Okay. So if you think of your module as a field, if you have a group acting on a field extension, then you get a chase map from the field onto the fixed field, okay. which essentially is just an orbit sum. This is the trace of the endomorphism determined by S, but this is honestly just a, an orbit sum. And if this map is surjective, then L is projective as a representation. Okay. This is the normal basis theorem, more or less. Okay, This is the normal basis theorem that says that if you have a Galois extension, um, then you can get um, that the field is projective um, for the Galois group. Okay. This is the concept that we want to generalize um, for group schemes, okay? This transfer map. So this is absolute projectivity. So now the relative version, okay, is rather simple to state, I think. Relative with respect to what? Relative with respect to a subgroup, okay? So we fix a subgroup H of the group gamma, and we call a module not projective, but relatively projective, relative to H, okay? If all the properties that we saw, okay, do not hold always, but they hold conditionally. Okay. So the lifting property holds over the group if it holds over the subgroup. Spelled out what this means is given a diagram over gamma, if when I restrict it to the subgroup H, meaning that I take all my modules and all my maps viewed as maps over the subgroup, if I can complete the diagram over the subgroup, then I can complete it over the whole. Okay. So I can't always find this map, this lifting map. I can only find it if I can find it for the subgroup. The same idea goes with the splitting one. If you're given a surjection, you can't always find the splitting map, the section. But if you can find it for the subgroup, okay, if when you restrict it for the subgroup, you get a splitting map, then you can get the splitting map for the whole. Similarly, P is no longer a summon of a free module, but it's a summon of what we call a relatively H free module. Okay. This is just a synonym of the induced representation, 
which I will recall in the next slides and define. Okay. Finally, in Galois theory for field extensions, the concept is relatively simple again. Okay. Instead of the classical trace map, you get a relative version okay, from the fixed subfield with respect to the subgroup to the fixed subfield with respect to the whole group, which is an orbit sum again, but now not over all group elements, but over a system of coset representations. Okay. If this map is surjective, then the module L is projective relative to the subgroup. A comment here is that at the first glance, this map is not well defined in the sense that there is a choice involved, right? You choose coset representatives, uh, but it's easy to prove that uh, this choice doesn't matter. Okay, so this map is well defined. In any case, this is the relative field trace, okay, from Galois theory. This is what we want to generate. Uh, Costa, you have a comment, you have a question on the chat. I'm oh, sorry. Whether the subjection is on the other way around. In the second part, you mean a subjection from... No. No, no. The subjection is always a projectivity. You have a subjection from the projective thing onto anything, okay? Right, remember, you you split the subject. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, sorry, you're right, you're right, you're right. Yes, the subjection is the other way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good. I'll fix the typo for the um, for the slides when I send you. Thank you. So, um, relative projectivity. How does it give us? The split exactness. Um, well, if you have a complex of modules and you can think of your complex being the check complex, okay, then the complex is split exact under two conditions. If given any collection of subgroups, the modules in the complex are relatively projective to the groups in the collection. And the complex is split exact when you restrict it to any group in the collection. The second condition is not too bad because one can use induction, induction in the sense now of logic, right? Uh, base case, um, inductive step and so on. You can use induction to verify this argument, okay? The whole point is that if your modules are projective relative to some subgroups, okay? And for these subgroups, the complex is split exact, then you have split exactness over the complex, okay? So this is the weakest version of projectivity that implies split exactness, if you wish. Okay, if everything was projective, everything would be split exactly and it would be hard. Okay. But of course, this is too much to ask. So for us, the complex is the check complex, and the modules that make up the complex are localization. So what we have in our logical dependencies is that if we prove relative projectivity of these localizations, at least in the case of groups, we have not spilled, but split exactness, uh, which implies that we get our bound. Okay. But this is only for groups. And now we want to generalize to group schemes. Okay. And to generalize to group schemes, we will go one step above, okay, in the possibly mentality of the rising sea argument by Groth and Dick. Okay. We will do it generally, okay, for homomorphisms of non-commutative rings. So given a map of rings that I want them to be my group algebras, OK? 
okay, but you can do it in general. Uh, then you can play, you can, you have an interplay between A modules and B modules. If you have a module for the big thing, you can always restrict it to a module for the small thing, okay? You just define multiplication over the small ring using this mapper. This is called restriction of scalars huh? or the pullback. Okay, pullback comes from geometry. You can do it for sheaves on schemes. Okay, it's the same thing. So this is the pullback. Uh, but if you start with a module for the small ring, you can get two modules for the big ring. Okay. You can use tensor product, which is extension of scalars or induction. And in category theory, this is F lower exclamation mark. Or you can use the home functor and co-extend the scalars or co-induce. And this is the push forward. Okay. So from B modules, you go back to A modules. From A modules, there's two ways to go to B modules. These constructions are functorial in the sense that they behave well under homomorphisms. So you get functors, okay? You get functors between modules for the small ring and modules for the big ring, okay? Restriction takes you down. Induction or co-induction takes you up. And it is well known that these functors are adjoined, okay? Induction is left adjoined to restriction, which is left adjoined to co-induction. What does that join mean? Well, I mean, in theory, intuitively, you can think it as a very weak form of equivalence. It's weaker than equivalence, okay? Formally, it's just an equality on home set, okay? This is just a definition, but it's just a weak form of equivalence, okay? So given these definitions, we can give the formal statement for relative projectivity. Over groups, over groups. This is a theorem going back to the 1950s. In the bibliography, they call it Higman's theorem, but it was a variant of it was proved by Ikeda a year before. Okay, which is exactly the slide we saw two slides ago. Okay. Um, again, I have the typo as I say, I pointed it out here. Uh, but the point is that a module is relatively projective to a subgroup if it satisfies this conditional looping property or the conditional splitness property. Okay. And now these three and four are new. Three is that M is a sum of these relatively H free are just the induced module. Okay. This is the appropriate notion because if H is a trivial subgroup, then this is just a free module. This is copies of the original thing, okay? And there's a fourth characterization, which is the generalization of the field. Okay. The module is relatively projective if this trace or transfer map, okay, which takes an endomorphism, again, you can think about field endomorphisms as before, okay, into the orbit sum endomorphism is surjective. Okay. Normal basis theorem, more or less. Okay. Some comments. I introduced co induction, but I didn't use it in Hidman's paper. The reason is that induction and co induction for finite groups. Agree, it's the same thing. Okay. Second comment is an example of relative projectivity is that all modules, all representations are always projective relative to the silo P subgroups of your integrity. This is because for a silo P subgroup, the index is invertible. So the trace map is always subjective. Okay. Another comment is that this thing that I call either trace or transfer, trace is more appropriate to Galois theory, transfer is more appropriate to group cohomology. Okay. This is a more general map 
that can be defined in terms of home sets, okay? And if you can define something on home sets, then you can derive it. So it gives a map on the derived functors, which are group cohomology. It's an indispensable tool for group cohomology, as is its sibling. Whenever you have a trace, you also have a norm. Um, but norm is even harder to work with. And the last two comments is that if you read Higman's criterion, the first three points can be very easily generalized to more general contexts, right? These are just formal. You can do this for any finite dimensional. Okay. The problem is the fourth point. Why is the fourth point the problem? Because I define the trace as an orbit sum. Okay. And this expression does not have an immediate analog for group schemes. Okay. Because we said that quotients don't work well, cosets are not very easy to understand. So the whole point to be able to proceed to push Sigmund's criteria into the world of group schemes is to generalize the transfer. Okay. And I will generalize the transfer categorically. Okay. This is a categorical construction. The concept of induction, restriction, and co-induction as a joint functors transfers, translates very well into the context of group schemes. Because any inclusion of a closed subgroup gives rise to a ring homomorphism on group algebras. So I get the construction, restriction, induction, co-induction. The difference between group schemes and groups is that induction is no longer the same as conduction. They are different. Now, my goal is to define a transfer map. So, a map that takes an H endomorphism of M and spits out a G endomorphism of M. So, if I take an H endomorphism of M, and I want to get a G map, the natural thing to do would be to induce, because this gives me a G map. Or co-induce. This gives me a G map as well. But this is not a map from M to M. If I want a map from M to M, I need to somehow fill this question. Either the top trapezoid or the bottom trapezoid. I need a map from M to the induced module or the other way around. And this can be done using the unit and the co-unit of the adjunction. So when you have an adjunction between functors, you always, an equivalent characterization of two functors being a joint is the existence of co-unit and unit pairs. Okay. These are mapped unit is eta, co-unit is epsilon. I use subscript L because this is the left adjunction. Okay, I is left to R and C is right to R. So I use the subscript R for right. Okay. So I can fill that diagram. Mm -hmm. Given a map between M over H, I can either induce or co-induce. I can take the unit of the right adjunction, gives me this map, but I don't have this question mark here. Okay, then we go to the induction part. The co-unit gives me this map, but I don't have this question. The problem is that these two maps don't exist. So other viewpoint, I'm transferring what I have from this diagram here, okay? I have the map from M to CRM, that's it. I have the map from IRM to M, that's it. Mm -hmm. And now I'm looking for a map between co-induction and induction. For groups, this exists. Co-induction is the same as induction. 
So I can feel it. For group schemes, it does not exist. However, there is a weaker relationship, which tells me that if I twist induction by some fixed one-dimensional representation, I get coinage. Okay. So they are not isomorphic, but they are not too far away from each other. Okay. I have a relationship between a twisted version of induction and coin induction. What this tells me you know, is that instead of starting with a map from M to M, I should twist with this lower case mu. So instead of M to M, I get something from M tensor mu to M. Why? Because when I induce this map, I get something from induce M tensor mu, which is the same as coin mu. So this gives me the missing map that I want. Okay, this is my categorical definition of the transfer. I am aware that I have probably lost most, if not all of you in this construction. It's fine, mm -hmm. it's fine. What I want us to keep is that I can generalize the orbit sum viewpoint on the transfer by constructing this categorical map, okay, using adjunctions, which, if specialized to the group case, gives me the orbit sum. Okay. So this generalizes the viewpoint of field trace. This generalizes the viewpoint of transfer on group cohomology okay. by using a formal categorical map. Okay. That's all. And since I have that map, I can now restate Higman's criterion on finite groups. Okay. This is something that we proved with Peter Simons in an upcoming, let's say, preprint, which we're still writing up. But I mean, the ideas are more or less there in two papers, one by Morita of the Morita equivalents from the 1960s and one uh, of Michel Bruet from 2009. Okay. They more or less uh, do the same construction. The idea is that we have these four equivalent characterization of relative projectivity. The most useful is this abstract version of the chase map. Okay. It doesn't matter how it's defined. It doesn't matter that much um, the details, if you wish, of the units called units. It exists. And it does the same thing as it does for fields. If this map is surjective, then the module is relatively projective. So we extend the diagram of logical dependencies, which now says that if I can prove that this new categorical trace is surjective on the localizations of the ring, then I can follow the arguments that I had before and end up with a bound in the degree of the gender. So the last part is the last five minutes, maybe. Okay. How do I prove trace subjectivity? Okay. And of course, so far, today at least, I've been using only representation, right? It's natural that I will need to use some other way. Okay. And the geometric property that I want is the concept of a fixed point subscheme. Okay. So when a finite group, group scheme acts on an affine scheme X, I can consider the geometric fixed points. What are the geometric fixed points? I can define them either abstractly, the largest closed subscheme on which the group acts trivially. Mm -hmm. Or I can define them functorially for each K algebra A. I get all the elements that are literally fixed by all group elements. Right? G of A is a nonest group. 
Mm -hmm. So I can just consider the action locally. A quick comment is that geometric fixed points are conceptually very far from algebraic invariants. These are two different worlds. Okay. In one case, in one case, I have the inclusion of the invariants in the name. If I apply spec, I get a map from the scheme to the orbit space. Geometric fixed points live inside X, which mean that algebraically they are given by an ideal of S. So if I go to the ring version, algebraic invariants are here, fixed points are an ideal in S. They are two different worlds. The whole point, though, is that these can be determined from this weird categorical transfer that I give. Okay. So the theorem, and this is the most difficult um, thing we had to prove. Uh, so I'm not going to give you details, but this has given us the most trouble. Is that if the fixed point subscheme is empty, then the trace is surjective onto the invariants. If you rephrase this a little bit, fixed points empty mean that the defining ideal is the whole of S. Transfer surjective on invariant mean that the ideal determined by the transfer is the whole of G, F, G, S, G. So the theorem says that the inclusion of S, G into S takes the transfer ideal into the ideal defining the subscheme and vice versa. And this is the link between geometry and representation. And maybe the last comment before I state the final version of the theorem is that if you have a fixed prime ideal in the spectrum of the ring, then the localization is necessary if the localization is empty, then the transfer is surjective, and this is what we wanted mm, to split the check complex. Okay, so this is my whole proof. Mm, my whole proof is that if I can prove emptiness of the fixed point subscheme, my theorem, our theorem with Peter Simon say, says that the transfer is surjective. Higman's criterion tells us that the localizations are le relatively protective. The theorem I showed you tell us that the check complex is split exact. By definition, the local cohomology vanishes. By definition, this is a bound on the regularity, which by Mumford's result, hmm, this is the bound on the degrees of the generator. Okay. So going towards my conclusion, this is more or less the proof of our main theorem. Okay. The main theorem says that if the group acts on the polynomial ring and we assume a unipotency property, then the degrees of the generators are bounded. I'm running out of time. I will not go over these arguments, but essentially the proof is this diagram. Okay. This is the proof of the theorem. And this is not the most general version. Hmm? The most general version tells us that we can actually generalize to a larger class of rings than polynomial rings, as long as these rings have a nice property. Okay. A nice property is what Karagusian and Simons call the structure theorem. I cannot go over due to time restriction. Okay. 
But if one can prove that the ring satisfies this structure theorem, then one gets the bound on the degrees of the generators and this property of in the composable finiteness with which I will conclude as promised mm, by just making a general comment addressed to the non-representation case that in every aspect of representations, groups, Lie algebras, quivers, algebraic groups, everything, mm, the fundamental question is always to decompose a module into in the composable representation. This is, if we can do that, we know everything about it. The problem is that polynomial rings are infinite dimensional as representations, as vector spaces. They are of finite type, finitely generated algebras, but infinite dimensional. Another problem is that in the composable modules in general are completely out of reach, okay? infinitely many unclassified. Most cases, we have wild representations. Okay. So infinite dimensional thing, infinitely many unclassifiable in the composable objects, but under our assumptions, the polynomial ring only has finitely many in the composable subjects. So there is some control in the representation. Okay, that's all I had to say. I rushed and I waved my hands in a few parts, uh, but that was the best I could do. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and for your patience uh, of still being here. Uh, and maybe uh, since I did not have any pictures or any comics um, in today's talk, I will just conclude with a summary of all the people that I refer to, these are not everyone, right? There were also, I did not have pictures of Ikeda or Morita or Brue or Fogarty or Fleischmann or Peter Simons and so on. Um, but at least, you know, um, these are the people that, whose uh, work has helped most uh, produce this result. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you, Costas, for an another nice talk and thank you for all the three talks in the series so let me stop the recording